Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for sticking around after lunch. Now that we've all been fed, I can definitely thank the Stanford Artificial Intelligence and Law Society for putting this panel after lunch. It's kind of a tough topic to digest on an empty stomach. Um, I'll go through a round of introductions and then let our speakers have at it for many presentations. And then I'll ask questions as the moderator privilege. And then we'll open it up to the audience um, like we've been going all day. So um, to my right, I have Captain Rob Lawless. He is currently serving as an assistant professor in the Department of Law at the United States Military Academy at West Point in New York. He is a judge advocate in the United States Army and has served as an operational and administrative law attorney for US troops in Afghanistan and as a prosecutor in the 3rd Infantry Division in Fort Stewart, Georgia. And all the way over here, we have Bonnie Dougherty who is a lecturer on law and the Associate Director of Armed Conflict and Civilian Protection at Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic. She's also a senior researcher in the Human Rights Watch Arms Division. And she's an expert in disarmament and international humanitarian law. She's done extensive field research on the civilian effects of war and worked on the negotiation and implementation of various treaties, including those banning nuclear weapons and cluster munitions. Um, in the recent years, Dr. Bonnie has been at the forefront of the movement to ban fully autonomous weapons and has published widely on the topic. Um, we also have Lieutenant Colonel Joe Larson, who serves as an intelligence officer in the United States Marine Corps. He is the deputy chief of, of the Algorithmic Warfare Cross-Function Team, otherwise known as Project Maven. He has previously deployed in Iraq, along with other theaters for counterterrorism operations. And he's also an alumnus of Stanford Law School, class of 2010. And over here, we have Laura Nolan, who is an industry software engineer specializing in reliability. She left Google in 2018 in protest over the company's involvement in Project Maven. And Laura is also a member of the International Committee for Robotic Arms Control. So we'll go in the order that everyone was introduced. And if you could take some time to introduce what you work on and your general thoughts on AI and warfare. And we'll delve deeper into discussions and questions after that. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you especially to the organizers uh, who put this together. I'm really excited to be out here in Stanford, my first time out here. Uh, it's great to see uh, all of you here. I'm excited to be in a suit. Um, I uh, usually wear what look like camouflage pajamas to work. So um, I bought the suit after law school thinking I'd use it. And then I joined the Army. So I take every opportunity I can to put it on. I'm going to talk about three things in these opening remarks very briefly. I'm going to tell you what I do at West Point. Then I'm going to ask you all a few questions, actually. Um, and then I'm going to make a few very brief points uh, as an overview. Oh, already there. That's West Point. OK. Uh, that's where I work uh, and live, by the way. <laughs> uh, this is the academic buildings over here. Officer housing, where I live, is back behind this hill. OK. So, just like Stanford, right? Um, uh, can't get a good bowl of uh, Vietnamese beef noodle soup, though. Uh, so I really appreciated being out here for that. Um, bit of military trivia for you. Uh, this thing, this academy goes back to 1802. That's when it started. But it was a military base before that, an installation uh, set up by George Washington. Um, strategically located on the Hudson River. You'll see, the, oops. You'll see the double bend in the Hudson River. A little military strategy for you. That double bend slowed down the British ships in strategic location so that uh, they'd have to slow down and then they could, we could bombard them from uh, up in the hills. Um, yeah. Uh, I teach law at West Point. Um, our cadets, we call our students cadets because they, uh, when they graduate, they're going to become military officers. Um, I teach them constitutional, military law, and operational law, uh, the law of war, um, which I'm about to talk about. I also, um, we also have a institute at West Point called the Lever Institute for Law and Land Warfare. It's been around for five or six years. It's, uh, our commitment is to fostering a uh, discussion in this area. Um, so it is fantastic to be out here. And again, I'm really appreciative of uh, events like this. In the fall, we're hosting um, a, a, a conference in October that we're calling the Law of War in the year 2040. What's it going to look like? 
All right, so we're going to be talking about a lot of similar things. Um, this is an important area, obviously. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm a practicing attorney. That's important for you to know as well. Uh, I, I am a judge advocate, which is, which is what we call Army lawyers. Um, I am currently stationed at West Point uh, as an instructor, but uh, it is a rotation. Uh, I, before that, I was an operational attorney. I advise commanders on what the law is and what it requires them to do. And when I leave West Point, I will do that again. Right? So I am, I am currently in an academic role, but I am really an operator. I'm an operational attorney. Um, and that uh, is, I think, important for you to know because um, you need to know uh, what perspective I'm bringing here. And I want to know what perspective you're bringing here, too. So I want to ask a couple of questions. This, uh, you know, it's voluntary. Raise your hand if, if you're inclined to. This is for our benefit, really. Um, we want to get a sense of what kind of experience we have in the room. I think it's important for us to know so that we can tailor our remarks accordingly. Um, how many lawyers in here? OK. Or, or law students, I should say. Lawyers or law students, OK. Um, anyone in here have military service before, military experience? OK. Or, or a family, an immediate family member with military experience. Great. Um, anyone with field experience in human rights, out, out, you know, with a human rights background or been out in the operational field? Okay. Several of those. Um, anyone, uh, if if you've practiced, studied, whether formally in a classroom or on your own the law of war, what's also called international humanitarian law. Okay, so some, but not all. Okay, all right, that's useful information um, for us all, I think, to know, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm a, so I'm gonna make three quick points. Before I do that, I have to say that um, these are my views. Okay, I work for the DOD, I work for the United States Army. Um, nothing I say uh, necessarily reflects uh, the views of those organizations. We're, we're required to say that, okay? But it happens to be true. Um, okay, so um, what, kind, what is the body of law we're talking about here? Right? This is AI in warfare, right? So, you know, warfare is not a legal term. The legal term is armed conflict. That's why sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the law of armed conflict. You'll also hear it referred to as International Humanitarian Law, or IHL. Uh, they're basically synonyms. There might be some difference at the margins, but for our purposes, we're going to treat them the same. Uh, and the, uh, I can't see the red dot up there, but same box. Uh, law, it's sometimes called the Law of War. That's kind of a, a little bit more antiquated, but the DOD, Department of Defense, still refers to it as a Law of War. You'll see the Latin term below that, Ducium Bello, the Law in War. Okay, or right, right, uh, right in war for those who want to check my Latin. Okay, now our, the law that applies in armed conflict, I'm, I'm going a bit over, I, just, I realize. Um, the law that applies in armed conflict is different than the law that applies during peacetime. That's really important to know. The law that applies in peacetime is over there on the right. That would be domestic criminal law. That would be international human rights law. Or these are bodies of law that assume a level of peace <laughs> And they, they therefore assume that force, whether lethal or non-lethal, is going to be used as a last resort. We don't want state actors using, during peacetime, force as a first resort, or even a second. We want them to use it as a last resort. When the legal definition of an armed conflict is met, that is a signal right, that the circumstances are different, the underlying assumptions are different. We are assuming a state of military conflict. And so we have a special body of law on the left that talks about that. That's the law of armed conflict. Okay, so um, the, the law is quite different during armed conflict. The force is no longer um, required as a last resort. It's, it's allowed as a first resort. Death and destruction is permitted during war. The law permits it. And to the shock of many, civilian death and civilian casualties, that is to say, non-combatants, non-service members, civilian death and civilian destruction is not necessarily unlawful. Okay, that's, the, that's what IHL, that's the premise of IHL. 
It may become lawful if it's disproportionate. We could talk about that. These are the basic assumptions of the law of armed conflict. All right. Um, I'm going to stop there uh, because I'm, I'm already over my time. Um, but thank you. Look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Yeah, we can talk a little bit more about the definitions. And if people have questions, uh, no question is you know, too basic Absolutely. to understand. Absolutely. Um, Bonnie, maybe you can speak a little bit about the concerns that Human Rights Watch has about fully autonomous weapons. Sure. Um, thanks, Marta. And thanks, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to join this this event, which has been great so far. I really enjoyed hearing about some of the other areas in uh, which AI relates to human rights. To human rights. Um, so I want to focus on the way that AI has the potential to revolutionize war, uh, warfare, armed conflict in alarming ways. And I'm specifically concerned with its use in what we call fully autonomous weapons, also known as lethal autonomous weapon systems or killer robots. All these terms are sort of the same thing. And by that, I'm referring to weapon systems that would be able to select and engage targets without meaningful human control. So it's a step beyond existing armed drones and that the uh, human would not be making the ultimate decision about applying force or taking a human life. The technology is moving rapidly in this direction, and some scientists have said that it could uh, be deployed in years, not decades, and less action is taken to preempt it. So I want to focus uh, my, my brief remarks on some of the challenges that fully autonomous weapons present and explain why Human Rights Watch and others are calling for a new uh, treaty that would um, address these challenges. These weapons systems raise a host of moral, legal, accountability, and security concerns uh, that we believe outweigh any purported military advantages. For on the moral side, many people, including the UN Secretary General, have described these systems as, quote, morally repugnant. Inanimate machines um, cannot understand sort of the, the value of human life and therefore should not be given the power to determine when to take it. And uh, the concerns on this front also are that uh, fully autonomous weapons would reduce human life to an algorithm, depriving human targets of their dignity, which again relates to the uh, human rights in that case, because it's a principle of human rights, the, the dignity is. Uh, they would also, fully autonomous weapons would also face serious concerns under international law. Um, and here I'd refer to international humanitarian law, uh, which Rob recently, very usefully uh, laid out, as well as international human rights law. On the human rights side, the right to life prohibits arbitrarily depriving a person of life. It doesn't, it's not an absolute prohibition against killing, it's an arbitrary dep deprivation. And I would disagree uh, respectfully with Rob that it applies in war and armed conflict, although. IHL very much informs how it is applicable in war. Uh, but right to life requires weighing uh, the necessity and proportionality of a use of force, which requires the application of human judgment, which is something that's very hard to replicate in, in machines. Similarly, uh, IHL's proportionality principle prohibits attacks in which uh, expected civilian harm outweighs anticipated military advantage. And again, balancing these factors requires the application of human reason and judgment in a complex and dynamic situation on the battlefield. And not only would it be difficult to replicate these human qualities, but a system could not be pre-programmed to deal with all the infinite number of unforeseeable circumstances it might encounter in that environment. Another provision I'll mention briefly, been happy to expand on later, is the Martin's Clause, which is a provision of international humanitarian law, the sort of law that merges law and morality. Uh, it says in the absence of a specific treaty, which is a case here, civilians and combatants are protected by the principles of humanity and dictates of public conscience. And we believe there are concerns under both of those. Again, happy to elaborate on that later. <laughs> a, another set of concerns relates to accountability, which is both human rights law and international humanitarian law require holding individuals, not just states, legally responsible for uh, significant violations. Uh, but we believe there are obstacles to holding uh, anyone individually responsible for the harm caused by fully autonomous weapons, at least in most cases. Um, for example, commanders, uh, unless they intentionally plan to use the fully autonomous weapon to commit a war crime, for example, they would likely escape liability because they could not prevent an unforeseeable action of an autonomous robot, nor could obviously punish the robot after the fact. Uh, and there's also evidentiary and practical hurdles to holding manufacturers or programmers responsible in a civil suit. And then lastly, uh, there are secure, security concerns, um, which is include that the technology would likely proliferate to states, and by that meaning countries, we're an international law world here, um, but states and non-state armed groups that would have little respect for 
uh, international law. Uh, it might lead to an international arms race. It might lower the threshold to war by making it uh, less costly to militaries to engage in conflict. So those are the range of concerns, and I find it interesting that when I've talked to people, people latch on to different ones. But for me, it's sort of the cumulative effect. In response to these concerns, uh, many states and NGOs have called for a new international treaty that would create a clear global norm against fully autonomous weapons. And this would follow the footsteps of previous disarmament treaties, such as those banning chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons, as well as anti-personnel landmines and cluster munitions. It would also follow the precedent of the 1995 preemptive ban on blinding lasers, which was a uh, protocol that uh, helped stop an emerging technology before it was deployed. In our view, such an instrument um, should ensure that humans retain control over life and death decisions. The treaty could have a positive obligation requiring states to maintain meaningful human control over the use of force. Alternatively, or in addition, it could include a prohibition on the development, production, and use of um, weapons that lack such meaning control. Uh, the positive obligation is probably more future-proof, uh, and the prohibition would allow addressing development and production, so that, again, they could be uh, done together or separately. Mm -hmm. And finally, just uh, one word about the state of play. Um, there's currently international discussions going on about how to deal with these, the prospect of this technology under the UN's Convention on Conventional Weapons meetings in Geneva. And that's a treaty that regulates indiscriminate and humane conventional weapons. Um, from our perspective, there have been encouraging signs at a meeting in Geneva in March. There have been discussions for several years. But at this meeting, a majority of countries called for a new legally binding instrument. And there's widespread convergence around the importance of maintaining human control over the use of force. States differ maybe on what that might mean, um, but there's a convergence on this general principle. Uh, challenges do exist. Uh, for example, the body is a consensus body, so any one or two states can, can block progress. But momentum for action is growing, whether in this form or another. So in, any way, in conclusion, just say I'm happy to elaborate on any of these issues when we get to the Q&A. That's sort of a brief overview of where we stand on the issue. So thanks. Thanks, Bonnie. And Joe, there's, there's going to be a lot of applications of AI in the US military. Why is Project Maven a priority? And tell us more about Do Project. I need a button or to talk? No. Okay. Let's go on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. So um, by way of introduction, I'll do that really fast, and then I will we'll answer your question. Uh, so my name's Joe Larson. I am uh, the, the deputy chief of Project Maven. It is the Project Maven that is referenced in the news. Uh, a little bit of background. I went to school here. Um, uh, was a practicing attorney at a law firm, was very bored with it, bounced around in the defense sector for a few years in industry, was a contractor at DARPA, and then in 2016, early 2016, I was uh, remobilized on active duty. I've done several stints on active duty. So I am on active duty now and have been since early 2016. And in 2016, I was chartered to lead a working group to look at the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning and defense intelligence applications. So we ran a working group out of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, so um, not in a military service, but under the civilian leadership of the DOD that ran for a period of a number of months. And we, did, we looked at the state of the technology, and we provided those recommendations to our leaders, who in April of 2017, so about a year later, um, formed what was called the Algorithmic Warfare Cross-Functional Team. And it was given the name Project MAVEN. So um, at that time, I was reassigned to be the deputy chief of that group and have been in that position now for a little over two years. So we've been running for two years. So um, now that's the background. To get to your question, which is, why are we doing this? Um, I would ask that you put everybody in the room, yourself, in the position of a policymaker or a United States general that has responsibility to maintain the national security of this country, right? You probably don't come from a tech background. You probably come from a background of driving a ship or flying a plane or leading an infantry formation, and, but you're following the news, um, you're, you're watching what's happening in technology, you're observing in your everyday applications the use of automation and algorithms to inform your work, and you frankly, if you're that policymaker or general, don't understand and want to know what are the implications for this technology for my mission to protect the United States. Um, I, and I, before I go into that, let me caveat. The, I'm going to ex be expressing a lot of views that are my own views. They are not the views of the Department of Defense. Um, it's very rare that uh, Project Maven, I'm authorized to come out of my basement. Um, I was allowed, I think, because Stanford Law is home turf somewhat. I went to school here. Uh, but um, so, you know, that, that's the question they're faced. Uh, and so 
the, the, the charter we were given was as a research and development effort to explore what it means to operationalize artificial intelligence technology. What is that? I know it's a scary term, operationalize. What did we mean by that? Well, what we meant was at the time, if you looked across the DOD, 500 AI projects in place, right? We didn't invent AI in the DOD. AI has been in the DOD for as long as it's been anywhere. As everybody in here knows, the early investments in DARPA and other programs, there's a variety of automation, AI, machine learning, deep learning efforts across the military services. But none of them focused on understanding what this technology really means at scale and for war fighting. Uh, to maintain national security. So they chartered us to explore that. So we are a research and development effort, and we've been running now for about two years. Um, our, my direct boss, uh, contrary to what may be out there, uh, it's not an Air Force initiative. It's an initiative under the civilian leadership of the DOD and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And ultimately, my boss is an Undersecretary of Defense, in, in this case, the Undersecretary of Defense for Military Intelligence. And his job is to provide insight, right, and knowledge to commanders that have to make battlefield decisions. That is what his job is. So, um, so I, I can walk through, I'm not gonna talk a lot about what we do in Maven. I can't go into the details, okay? I can talk broadly about the lessons we've learned. And I think you'll learn about our implementation through the lessons. Um, the, fir the first thing I would say is it's, AI is a very scary thing for the DOD. I, I've served in the military. I've been in combat multiple times. I've deployed to multiple theaters. And we take very seriously human control over the application of force. I want there to be no mistake about that, right? Um, there is a regulation in the Department of Defense, 3000.09. Many of you are familiar with it. Many of you may not be. It is the regulation that governs the use of uh, autonomous, uh, use of autonomy in weapon systems. I'll defer to Captain Lawless to sort of go into details if you have it. Everything, everything we do in MAVEN is strictly compliant with that as well as all of the other aspects of the rule of law, international, human, international humanitarian law with which we are aware. So we operate within those bounds. However, we recognize that AI creates challenges that may not have been considered in existing policy regimes, and there has to be research and development and exploration of what these technologies mean in combat to get to the insights that are necessary. My point here is that if you want an AI framework that's going to, that's going to, accomplish the objectives of the Department of Defense to protect this nation, its national security, and meet the objectives of um, maintaining our trust and confidence of our population, protecting privacy and civil liberties, doing it the right way. The only way to do it is to take it out of 500 small projects spread across the military services and do something fairly substantial, right? So, so what do I do in Maven? What are some of the key lessons we've learned? Uh, I'll close with this. The, the, the key lesson I think we've learned is that artificial intelligence and particularly machine learning technologies, right, require a different implementation paradigm than perhaps any other technology we've been faced with in the Department of Defense. That's widely recognized. Um, think about the way a traditional procurement would work for a DOD system. What would happen is you'd have a lot of study. I'll take air power as an example. You'd study an airplane in a laboratory. You'd gra gather PhDs. You'd gather all the aspects associated with the conditions that make this piece of metal fly through the sky at the appropriate speeds. You learn, you research, you develop, and then you procure. You take your money to a Boeing, a Lockheed, and you buy a system. And when that system is ultimately delivered to a commander, then who uses that system in combat operations, that commander has reliance in that process that's taken that system through a procurement that it's going to work, and it's going to work as expected. What we've learned in Project Maven is that when we're talking specifically deep learning, right, which let's cut to the case is what we're talking about here, that reliability is not there in existing systems the way we understand them now, right? There are investments. We need better explainability. And um, frankly, we've looked at industry and we've looked at academia and we're, we're discontented in the DOD that there is sufficient research and understanding the explainability and predictability of AI systems in real operational settings. So, um, you know, commanders ultimately are responsible for the use of force within their domain. I, I'm a Marine. I come from a naval tradition, and the captain goes down with the ship. If you're in charge of the ship and something happens on that ship, you are held to account, even if you didn't directly have knowledge. You have, you have the authority. You have the responsibility. Um, as a commander, and that's aviation assets, if your planes crash, you will be relieved of command, even if it was a hardware failure. 
These commanders want AI systems when they're delivered to perform to those same levels, right? They want them to be predictable and they don't want a system that's going to misperform at the time when it's supposed to be operational, either because it's not understood in its research or development or because it's engineered in such a way that perhaps there's something in there that causes it to misperform, right? So we're concerned about all those aspects. So what that means for us and what I'm really here to mention as we're in the heart of Silicon Valley is the industry engagement piece here is absolutely critical when we're talking artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, we have many industry partners in Maven. I won't be discussing any of them in particular, but I'll just say that it requires perhaps a more collaborative relationship with the experts in this domain than other types of uh, projects that involve defense technology, right? We need the researchers who understand the implementation of this technology to partner with us to, to make it work in the real world and then to inform us as to the limitations of that operational system in the real world. This is a partnership and there is a reason why in many cases the partnerships that have been engineered here have not been the traditional partnerships that you've been accustomed to, the DOD really you know, coalescing all the procurement activities within the 495 Beltway. So that, that's kind of the message I'm here to deliver. I'll close, last comment. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody. I think it's I think it's frankly exceptional that we live in a society with a degree of civility that we can have a panel with such differing viewpoints on these things. Um, I, I really represent no viewpoints. I represent the Department of Defense. My job is to execute a project, right? And I'm doing that. I'm proud of the project and I'll explain what we do. I know people on this panel have, have been involved in the protests of that project or their company's involvement in that project. And frankly, I think it's great we live in that kind of society. Nobody wants to live in a society where IP that's generated is then nationalized for defense use without the consent of either the companies or the employees within that company. So I personally bear, you know, I personally bear no ill will and I think in the Defense Department we have a position that we're proud that we have industry that's thinking hard about the issues while we think hard about the issues ourselves to get this right as all of us are going on this journey of exploration together. So I think the civility here is really great. I think it's unique to our society and I'm very proud of it. And with that, I'll give up my time. Uh, thanks for laying that out. Maybe we can go to Laura now so she can talk about some of the technical considerations around AI and warfare and human rights implications of that. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, I am a technologist. Um, at, last year I worked at Google and we'll go into that story in a little while. Um, so I'm sort of a generalist technologist, but my biggest area of um, expertise is reliability and safety in distributed systems. Um, I also did a master's about five years ago, I finished up, and I did quite a lot of artificial intelligence stuff during that. So I have written neural networks from scratch. I know a fair bit about this area as well, without, but I'm, you know, I'm not, not a professor of AI. So, um, by the way, I should also say that I'm Irish and I worked at the Irish office of Google as well, so not my military. So, um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about a bunch of concerns that I have around militarization of, um, of artificial intelligence, and also some places where I think it's a really good thing, okay? So, but first I wanna start talking um, off by saying, I don't think that we should talk about artificial intelligence ethics. I really don't. I think that we should talk about technology ethics. And the reason that I say that is because I think it's great that there is so much interest right now around AI ethics. That's so positive and so good. But there, as a technologist, there is not really a bright line between what is AI and what isn't. You know, back when I was doing my undergrad, um, more than 20 years ago now, was when I started, um, there were things that we considered AI at the time that are not considered AI now. They're considered very basic algorithms, right? There's this pattern where a problem gets solved, and, and, and until it's solved, it's AI and it's super hard, and then it's solved and it's like, oh, meh, we can do that now, right? Like playing chess, that was like a huge hurdle for AI um, researchers back in the 60s and you know like now you can you've got chess playing programs on your phone right so we should talk about technology ethics because there's a lot frankly there's a lot of people and there's so much hype around AI there are many people who are doing things with AI and machine learning that you could do with a, a structured query language query right perfectly conventional technology and it's not okay to do to do it with one and not the other right so let's talk about technology ethics right um, there there are some some issues around explainability and understandability that are more prevalent in AI systems, but they're not unique because, I mean, even a conventional non-AI technology system can be very complex and very hard to understand. So, um, yeah. 
what are the issues that I see around artificial intelligence and warfare? So, and technology and warfare generally. Um, technology and AI can be very black box in nature, and I completely echo what you say. You know, understanding and explaining what these systems are doing is it's, it's not a solved problem. And you know, from my reviewing of the literature, and I'm not a researcher in this area, nobody really has. You know, there's, there's two kinds of AI, right? There's the kind that you can explain, and there's the kind that works, and right now there's no real intersection between the two, right? <laughs> but that's the way it is, right? Um, like, we don't have answers to this. Um, another thing that I see is, as a technologist, I think that when we automate something, we're gonna get more of it, right? Who has more email now than they had paper mail back 20 years ago? All of you, right? Um, you know, we invent like we, we invent manufacturing, and then everyone has a storage unit, and we invent Marie Kondo. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she was born. I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't vouch for that. Um, but you know, we we're, we're going to automate functions of warfare. Are we going to are we going to reduce the threshold for going to war? Is you know that's a real worry, right? And I think that's something that we've already seen a little bit with unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, as everyone else calls them. Um, you know, like. We have seen drones used in warfare. There's been this sort of pushback against sending troops to, to various areas, and, and then you see this rise in use of unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, that could even go a step further if we, if, if like, I'm talking about kind of autonomous warfare here. If we start having autonomous drones that, can, that don't even need somebody to fly them, you know, the, the barrier to, to going to war drops even more. Another big problem that I see is the more automation that you have and the more autonomous the, the systems are, the more that you can have one or a very small number of individuals in control of a very large number of weapons. You sort of get this technological weapon of mass destruction. And that's really problematic, I think. Um, now, this is the best example I have of this phenomenon, and I actually made a US diplomat walk out of a United Nations side meeting when I said this before, so apologies, but um, like we've seen this phenomenon before. People will use the centralization of power that technology gives you to achieve political ends. And the best example of this is when the US ICE organization, they changed their, they have this expert decision support system that's a, that decides whether or not um, a, a person should be detained or not. So for political reasons, they changed that to say always detain. Um, could you envisage a scenario where we have a lot of automation in warfare, where somebody then decides, hey, we need to start you know, having more strikes, getting tougher, let's start reducing the thresholds in that system. You could have a lot of power vested in a very small or, or even a single person. And that's, you know, that's something I, I would like to see more principled and fine officers like these in the loop, you know? um, r rather than you know, one person who may, who may not even be operating in, in an approved way could potentially do a lot of damage. Um, there are, there are, there's an issue called a complex systems problem. Um, complex systems, everyone thinks they understand the word complex. There's a particular application in technology. Complex systems have multiple moving parts. They have um, a memory, a state, and you have feedback loops. So a really simple example here. Um, the, these, these systems, they spin out of control and they enter vicious cycles. Um, there's an example here where there was a book it, uh, this was uh, for sale on some secondhand books websites, like thinkpowells.com or something. Um, two sellers were selling it, and they were the only two sellers that were selling this book. One of them really had it, and one of them was going to uh, had a plan where if somebody ordered it, they'd purchase it from the other website and resell it, right? So two algorithms here. They were both automatically pricing the book each day. One of them uh, was going to price it to 2% lower than the other cost. And then the other one was going to price to 27% higher than the first one. And nobody noticed until the book was going for like $100 million or something outrageous. That's a complex systems problem, two interacting parts, right? And nobody intended the book to cost $100 million, right? But unintentional things happen. We see this as well in the stock markets. We have interacting bots pricing shares. And you know, it spins out of control constantly to the point where the stock markets have all implemented a circuit breaker, which whenever things start getting out of control, it stops trading. It lets the bots sort of you know, come back to their senses, right? There is no equivalent of that in warfare. If we start having autonomous, um, autonomously controlled machines on the battlefield, very complex environment, very complex systems interacting, could you have a flash war? There is no, no circuit breaker for a battlefield. Um, and you, you can't rely as well on, on remote communications. They can be jammed, as I'm sure you guys will agree. So, Complex systems problems are a thing. Um, 
Another thing that we have a problem with, I mean, even if one organization or one country developed impeccably perfect autonomous weapons and started to deploy them and use them, and even if they did genuinely act in a, a more reliable and more ethically responsible and more, more IHL compliant way, that would set a precedent that these weapons are okay. And then what if a less scrupulous country begins to deploy these weapons? You know, that, that's a real danger. I think setting, setting a precedent that these kinds of weapons are okay would be really problematic. And just to be clear, I don't think that that is technically possible to develop a weapon that can act ethically. I think it's, um, eth eth machines can't be ethical. They're not, they're not moral actors, right? They, can, they can't make a decision. They do what they're programmed to do. So I, I don't think it's possible, but I think even if, even if it was possible, setting that precedent is really dangerous because we'll enter an arms race. As, as has happened with drone warfare. I mean, an, an, an international precedent was set that you can use drones to, to, to perform strikes, and 76 countries have them now. Not armed, but 76 countries have got drone programs. That is a precedent that's been set. Okay, so very quickly, I'm gonna talk about what I think are positive, excellent applications of AI warfare. Um, so I think bomb disposal robots are brilliant. We should have more of those. You guys should have more of those. Um, I think there's been some great work done recently on artificial intelligence co-pilots for the um, Air Force. That's brilliant. I mean, um, you know, you can have a, it's very common to black out, you know, low oxygen, um, decompression sicknesses. And, you know, if you've got an AI co-pilot that can start flying your plane and save lives, fantastic. Um, and I think there's, there's some quite promising early work being done on cyber defense um, against cyber weapons. Um, so I think that's very positive as well, and maybe we'll possibly have some time to talk about that some more. But I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Right, no, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll actually pull a little bit on what you said, Laura, and lowering that threshold to war and what we talked about, how IHL is applied today and some of the definitions you mentioned initially. Can we talk about about how, how accountability works now as it relates to drone warfare. Um, where, what role do humans play in that process? When are humans good at complying with IHL? And when do they fail? Um, and maybe talk about future applications and how we see that disintegrate and why we need a better shared understanding of international humanitarian law. So whoever wants to touch on that. Yeah, I'm, I'll have, I'm happy to start. Um, there was a, well, there's actually several thoughts in there. Um, one of them was lowering the threshold to war. Um, here, another legal distinction needs to be made. <clears throat> um, there are two legal regimes that, are, that must be separated when talking about going to war and engaging in warfare. There is the law, there's a legal regime called the use ad bellum. The, uh, it's the right uh, of war, the right to go to war. Right? That is governed by the United Nations Charter, primarily. That is the threshold for war. And Article 2 of that convention, of that treaty, says force is prohibited. Right? Use of force against the territorial integrity of another, part of another country is prohibited. Right? Everyone should be saying that's no, right, that's not what we, we look around and there's war all around us, right? So there are exceptions to that prohibition. Um, if one country consents to another country using force within their borders, um, then Article 2 for the prohibition doesn't apply. Um, right now, the Afghan government is consenting to U.S. force in Afghanistan. Therefore, we're not, the United States is not violating that prohibition. Um, Self-defense, right? Article 51 of that charter says uh, the, the right to use force, uh, the right to engage in self-defense in, re in response to an armed attack, that's the legal term, right? If one country uses an, uh, engages in an unlawful armed attack against another country, then the country that suffered that armed attack has the right of self-defense. The United Nations Charter protects that. And then uh, third, in, in our international uh, current state of governance, unfortunately, the least relevant is if the United Nations Security Council authorizes one or more countries to use force. That's currently uh, something of a broken system because the countries on the Security Council 
often oppose each other on principle, right? So they're not going to come to a consensus, okay? So that's the threshold for going to war. That's the law that governs the resort to the use of force. That is a political decision that is made at the highest level, right? The, the, the decision to go to war is a decision made by our political leaders, as it should be. Right? And if we don't like that, if we don't like our political leaders sending us into battle, into war, then we should... Uh, we should oppose them on political grounds. We should. I, I, we should vote for uh, political leaders that um, have a moral sense of the repercussions of, of using military force. Right? That's me speaking as an American citizen. Right? I, you know, I ask soldiers that question too, by the way, and they're, they're probably going to agree, right? Because what soldier actually wants to go to war? Right? Not, not that many. Um, so that, but that is one legal regime. There is a separate legal regime you recall, I had up on the screen, there were three boxes. The lower left box, is uh, the top block was the one I just referred to, which was the law governing the resort to force. The, the, the separate one, the lower left box, was the law of a war, or international humanitarian war. This is the law that governs the conflict of hostilities. Okay, so once a war starts, this body of law applies, and it applies equally to both sides. There's, in every war, right, there's an aggressor and a defender, usually, right? And so the law of war premises itself on the fact that both sides will, the law will apply equally to them with the, good, with the goal of reducing suffering to the extent possible. Because the law of war, um, again, working under the assumptions of war, say, hey, there are these competing interests in war. Humanitarianism, right, the idea that the law of war very much is concerned with reducing suffering in war. But there's a competing concern, and it is military necessity. The idea that states are going to accept limits, but they also have a competing interest, and that is defeating the enemy. Right? Every war has this sort of assumption. Okay, so, um, and that body of law is the law that 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 law of war is the body of law I work in, right? And 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 people like me, right? Um, who work at the tactical level, who, who work in uh, armed conflict, um, in my position as, as, a, as a lawyer for those people is I, I want them to have the best weapons because if that first body of law works right, then we're in war because we're defending ourselves or because some partner who we care about for political or strategic reasons is being attacked as well. Right? So for, if we're in war for the right reasons, then we should equip our soldiers with the, the best possible um, tools. Okay, so um, I see dr drone warfare and um, AI as a, I mean, the other thing here to talk about is, is AI a weapon, right? AI is a, I see AI as a platform. Right? But that, that's a separate issue, I won't deal with that. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to deal with, but um, so uh, I think you need to separate those two bodies of law. One is a political question dealt with at the highest level, the other is, um, a, a compromise between military necessity and humanity, humanitarian considerations, um, and, and we, should, um, we should give our soldiers who are hopefully fighting for a just cause uh, the tools they need to um, satisfy that just cause. Okay, so maybe, maybe Bonnie, you could respond um, to this threshold for warfare, but also where does that accountability break down especially as we introduce greater levels of autonomy in lethal systems. Okay, um, I was also gonna if, address some of your questions about compliance with IHL, if that's okay as well, because um, I think it gets to, relates to the accountability concern. Um, so I was thinking about, I mean, there's a couple situations in which people don't comply with IHL or any international law for that matter. There's a situation of when there's an intentional violation of international humanitarian law, using that as its model, and um, that's, a, that's a war crime. That's when we rise to the criminal level, and that's where you definitely obviously need accountability. And one way to um, get at that is to increase the stigma against the action. So it's not just to make it unlawful, but one way a, a new treaty could help is to make it you know, politically, one way, international law is often enforced through the politics as well as, uh, as, well as through courts. So um, by making it a clear prohibition a clear rule on, um, in this case, I'm talking about the fully autonomous weapons more than the armed drones, having law on that would promote compliance. Um, 
as it does with other, other uh, IHL issues. And then there's also the issue of what control can bring, human control, and Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Larson also mentioned the issue of control, which I agree is very important. And that helps, again, promote compliance and promote accountability. So I think there's some things you need for control. Um, and one is an understanding of the operational environment you're working in and understanding the technology you're using. Um, and also another theme that some of my the fellow panelists mentioned was the predictability and reliability of technology. And if you have these and other factors, it can also it can increase the chances that what you're, you as a commander or operator are intending actually happen. So in that case, it, if assuming there isn't an intent to violate IHL, that if your intent is to comply, having human control can enhance that. Um, and then the second thing is it also can make it easier to hold someone accountable um, if they choose to uh, act in violation of the law because presumably they would have the information they, that um, they would know in advance or should have known in advance that whatever uh, system they're using or how they were using it would be uh, problematic and so therefore it's easier to uh, ensure that there's com accountability. So those, I think they relate both the preventing um, violations as well as holding people accountable after the fact. Uh, and what does U.S. Policy Directive 3009 say on this topic? Yeah, I can, I can take that, right? So um, it's a DOD policy, right? So it's, it's not the law. It's a DOD politic, you know, political decision to impose this policy. Um, uh, on itself. And the AI policy, again, is uh, DOD 3001, and the basic um, premise of the policy is um, human control, human judgment in weapon systems must be maintained, right? Um, the law of war um, requires certain judgments to be made. Earlier I said that sometimes um, Civilian death, as tragic it is, as it is, the law of war allows for civilian death and civilian destruction. That's not automatically illegal. But it does become illegal if the, the, the principle of proportionality is violated. The pr principle of proportionality says that if the collateral damage, that is civilian death, civilian destruction, is excessive, that's the legal term, excessive compared to the anticipated military advantage of the action in question, then the proportionality principle is violated. You can see the challenge that that presents, right? Um, is the, the, the death of these innocent civilians, the destruction of this uh, civilian property, is it excessive compared to the anticipated military advantage of the strike? What a horrible question to have to answer, but the law requires the commander to answer that. That is a judgment call, right? Um, certainly not today can we expect a machine, an, a, an algorithm, to make that decision. The ex, you know, comparing these two values, right? It calls for a human value judgment, and the DOD policy um, requires it. DOD policy is that the human must be in the loop, so to speak, so that he or she can make that judgment. The DOD policy 3009, uh, 3000.19 also states that humans must be accountable. Right? It, so to answer the accountability question, it is DOD policy that violations of the law of armed conflict <clears throat> uh, are borne by humans, must be borne by humans. Can I, can I just uh, put a point on that? Well, I was going to, because I think it's important that it does say in the 3000.09, human judgment to the maximum extent practical, right? It doesn't say all human judgment. And just to be quite clear, there are uses of autonomous weapons in practice in the DOD today, right? That's the reality. There are systems on our ships that prevent them from being attacked. When missiles are launched, systems will fire autonomously to take those miss missiles down. Right, as a young Marine, one of the first things you, you're introduced to is the concept of a claymore mine, right, which you put out in the field. And if it's triggered by whatever it launches, that is an autonomous system, right? So these things exist. But let's cut to the chase. What we're talking about here and where I think the concern really is, is when we're talking about the rapid integration of machine learning into that, uh, which is 
I'll just use that as our framework for artificial intelligence, even though it's much more complex, but just to simplify it, the, the, the judgments about what is happening, right, the predictability of the system is diminished and that causes great concern. So the question is, what are the bounds of 3000.09 and how does it apply to the introduction of machine learning technology, considering that 3000.09 was written in 2012, edited in 2017, and the state of the art has changed dramatically since then? These are very hard questions. Um, so with respect to 3000.09, as my understanding, it does say that human judgment must be applied, but um, as I understand it, if, if the human judgment is that it is okay to deploy something which operates in an autonomous fashion, then that is okay. I want to give an example of a weapon that exists today, in fact existed a few years ago. This is the Israeli Harpy loitering munition. So loitering munition is basically a drone that is armed. And the, it, what it does is it can patrol a particular area, and what it does is it looks for certain radar signals, and if it sees them, it blows them up. Um, They've actually they've recently come out with a, an updated version of it called the Harop, which actually has less autonomy. So apparently, even the Israelis thought that this was uh, a bit problematic. Um, so as, as I understand it, 3000.09 would not preclude a system like that being deployed if the commander in question judged that that was OK and, um, and, and took responsibility for it. Um, and so what, what I say is that 3000.09, it's the principles are pointing in, in the right direction, but as you say, it's not law, it's merely a policy. And it's also something that could potentially be stretched pretty far. Um, I would also like to add, add, add something else. Um, as you say, a, a claymore, a, a landmine, or a robot sentry is, is also potentially an autonomous weapon. But I think the, the, the more harm, or the more, the less predictable ones are the ones that are unbounded in both space and time operationally. I think those probably are the, are the, the primary focus. So, yeah, um, yeah, pretty much covers what I wanted to say. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. We're talking about human control, we're talking about human <coughs> judgment, and we're just now starting to grapple with what those terms mean. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. But also I wanna ask, um, state of existing technology today doesn't make military commanders comfortable uh, with these systems. What limits do you see as needing to be in place? What lessons have been learned from Project Maven? Um, what would make you comfortable defending the legal ramifications of a system or deploying alongside some human machine teaming system? It's, it's a great question. And obviously, we'd have to distinguish that there's no one answer to that question because it would depend on a variety of circumstances, right? What is the operational use of the system? Is it to gather intelligence? Is it related to the use of weaponry? Are we using it in the context of major combat operations where, you know, the, the maybe there's a there's a balance where the use of these technologies is required to achieve military objectives? I mean, there's a, so there's a lot of nuance to those questions. I would start, though, as a, you know, a blanket statement that applies across the, the range of scenarios that, that I just described would be, frankly, um, we need to advance the state of art for the test and evaluation of uh, technologies that use machine learning. And uh, we're frankly unsatisfied in the department that um, we're there, that we understand and are able to predict the outcome of the system. I think that would be a requirement for the widespread utilization of these systems. They have to be predictable, right? They have to be reliable and you know, have to, you'll have to know how they react in a given circumstance. That's why the Department of Defense is, I don't want to speak out of turn because I may be incorrect. I believe the largest AI investment, if not the largest, one of the largest AI investments is in the field of explainable AI, right? To get to the point of there's good AI and there's AI that's explainable and they're not the same thing. We, we need to bridge that. Which the um, has been working on for a while. Absolutely, yeah, and it's, it's a hard problem. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a requirement to get to, you know, the real operational utilization of these within weapon systems to achieve impact in combat, which is, seems to be where the concern seems to be arranged, is when you're putting an algorithm on a weapon. We could talk about surveillance as another issue, right, that's distinct, and maybe the concerns there are distinct, and we can certainly go into that um, if you're interested. But um, yeah, I would throw that out there. We should definitely talk about surveillance. I actually had that on my notes as well. Sure, Laura, can you talk a little bit about oh, testing uh, and evaluating these systems as well, and then you bring up the surveillance concerns? Absolutely. Um, I think if you're talking about machine learning systems and, in fact, complex systems generally and, and complex systems like the, the book example I gave, um, they are impossible to thoroughly test because the, the state space is too big, 
right? Um, even when you're talking about very simple systems like, like the book bots, or even uh, comparatively simple things like the stock market. Stock market is much simpler, much simpler than the, the, the battlefield. I think you'd probably agree. Um, you know, it's 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 a sphere of numbers, and it's a sphere that where you know things just you know prices go up and down, and you buy and sell things, right? That's much much simpler than you know a, a confused battlefield where you've got multiple robots, humans, God knows what's happening. People are trying to actively subvert your system. The stock market is simpler, and yet, and, and there's huge amounts of money on the line. You know, if if industry with that amount of money on the line cannot solve reliable testing of stock market bots. I think the hope for autonomous weapon systems is pretty slim. Okay, uh, you know, realistically, like the the state space just goes on forever. You know, um, somebody earlier was talking about um, targeting systems and how they trained up the um, and all the examples were either on sunny days or shadowy days. Um, you, you, you're not going to necessarily catch that in your testing if your if, if your test data set doesn't include that. Um, what happens when you know you're 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 deployed into a new theater of, of war and suddenly your your enemies are behaving differently, dressed differently, the art environment is different. I mean, how do you test how do you test your system if if it's if it is something very very with a lot of autonomy like the harpy? It's very difficult to, to test that in all, all situations. You you mentioned earlier that there exist autonomous weapons now. I think you were probably referring to the Aegis system. Yes. Aegis is a brilliant system. Um, I, I would support that. Aegis is a system, it's on, you can probably correct me when I go wrong. It's deployed on naval ships, and it's designed to be able to defend against a swarm of incoming missiles, right? So it has an autonomous mode, but there's a guy who sits there with a key and turns it on and turns it off. And if you don't want that system firing, it's turned off, right? It's only turned on in autonomous mode when you know that there's a bunch of missiles coming and you want your, your autonomous system to defend you. So it's a great system. It's been proved very safe in operation. And I fully support the, the military having that kind of system. That, that's good autonomy. That's good automation. It's defensive. It's deployed with a human who has a hardware override. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I say anything wrong? Okay, cool. Exactly. Totally his area. Um, should we talk about surveillance briefly? Um, yeah, so I think uh, certainly so privacy is, is a human rights issue, right? Um, mass surveillance is, or even you know, ma less mass surveillance is, is certainly a, a big ethical problem of our times, right? Um, there was a really good report, I think it's about five, six years old now, and I think it was done by Human Rights Watch or Amnesty. It's called Will I Be Next? And it talks about the impact of drone surveillance in Waziristan over the pre preceding 10 years. Not, not even specifically the attacks, just the surveillance, um, having drones flying around all the time. And um, you know, it, it changed people's behavior in, in quite a big way, because they knew that they couldn't, um, they couldn't behave, they couldn't gather in groups, so they can't go to weddings, funerals, uh, they can't have sort of political meetings. Um, people were keeping their kids home from school, so I think one of the big things about automation and 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 AI or not is having having more surveillance happening. It infringes people's rights to privacy and the actual awareness of the surveillance, particularly over a very long period of time, can be very damaging to, to people's lives and people's societies. So I'd be very interested to see what you guys have to say about that. And Bonnie as well from a sort of a human rights law perspective. Um, I haven't, to be honest, done as much on the research into the armed drones. I mean, I think there are um, obviously, definitely issues of, of privacy and um, humanitarian concerns. Um, I don't think that's. I don't want to speak out of turn on that front. So I'm not. Um, there's definitely. Let me phrase it this way. There's definitely human rights issues that need to be looked at. Um, maybe less about the. Some of it's about the technology, and some of it's about how the technology is used. And I think that differentiates a little bit from some of the the more fully autonomous systems, the ones we're more worried about, and not. I mean, HRW is worried about both, but in different in this sphere, um, which are sort of more problem with the, the the weapon itself, no matter how it's used. So definitely echo those concerns, but not as much personal experience in that area. So I'll just add on the human rights issue. Um, you know, earlier I said that the law of war, uh, the law of armed conflict, is applies once an armed conflict that that term is defined legally um, comes into effect. But Bonnie, Bonnie uh, pointed out, um, made a good point uh, in her follow-up to that, which is, you know, she said, well, she respectfully disagrees. Human rights law does continue to apply. And there is, uh, I, I think it was a good point, and, and there, there is debate among countries, right, and states, nation states, about the degree to which human rights law, one component of which is privacy, 
Uh, there's the right to life and the right against arbitrary detention, right? These, these human rights concepts that we, um, we want very much to apply during peacetime. The question is, how should those human rights laws apply during armed conflict? Can they apply? Uh, many states say yes. The United States um, position is that to some extent uh, they apply, not necessarily uh, some of the treaty obligations, but customary international law does apply. So it's, it's not that um, human rights does not apply during our human rights law does not apply during our conflict, conflict, but rather how it applies. And the United States position, and frankly many uh, states, nation states position, is that it must accommodate the nature of armed conflict. Right? And so um, surveillance during armed conflict is extremely important. You could imagine why, right? Um, uh, uh, it, it, we have an entire fun military function called intelligence gathering, right? We want to know about the enemy, right? The, the, the uh, opposing forces. Um, so uh, I, th I think there's a role for intelligence gathering during armed conflict, and I don't think that's particularly um, uh, controversial. The other point I just wanted to circle um, back on is um, the, comp the capability of the AI, right? If the AI is, uh, if the algorithm is making a decision and it's incorrect, right? Uh, it, it, the example was the sunny day, cloudy day example, right? Um, the law of war requires that combatants distinguish between civilians and military uh, combatants, right? And it requires that combatants distinguish between civilian objects and military objectives, right? So you can target a tank, you can target an opposing soldier, but you can never target a civilian or a civilian object. The law prohibits it. It's the most fundamental principle of the law of war. It says you cannot, the, a civilian or civilian object cannot be the object of an attack. A corollary of that is any weapon system used must be able to distinguish between those two things. So if the weapon system, is uh, the AI algorithm in this case, is, is only distinguishing between sunny days and cloudy days, in other words, if it can't distinguish between a civilian and a combatant, then it is an illegal weapon system. The law of war prohibits that. Right? So we can't even begin to have this conversation about implementing AI unless we can demonstrate that it comply with that principle, that principle of distinction. And so that's what Project Maven is aiming to do, identify objects, reach some level of distinction that's required under international humanitarian law. And Google recently dropped that contract and they came out with new AI principles around this. What does it mean for the US military and these partnerships that they're seeking in Silicon Valley if they're not able to work with large tech companies and they're forced or um, therefore they switch to working with startups like Underworld Industries. And I, okay, we won't name names. We won't talk about Google. And <laughs> But what does it mean when you're seeing these employee movements, tech workers organizing, where they don't want to work on weapons technology? Can they still work with the military? What because we just have this policy in place and we don't have law, and the policy actually includes loopholes where a um, senior commander in the Pentagon or general can override that policy. Well, let's, let's start with the easier part of that and then we'll move to the harder part. Um, so the easier part is, you know, um, so uh, for those that may be familiar, the department has announced the formation of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center the former director of Project Maven has moved over to be the director of that initiative. Uh, the, the, that initiative is the, the Department of Defense's official AI initiative, and its uh, mandate includes all sorts of utilization for artificial intelligence across the military that extend well beyond um, the more combat applications that have dominated our discussion here today. So, um, you know, as a Marine, for example, I would deploy on a Marine Expeditionary Unit, and one of the mission sets you're certified to do when you deploy is humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. So things like uh, when there's nuclear meltdowns or non-combatant evacuations, the Marines will be deployed into those environments. So the Joint AI Center has an initiative to look at that. They've got an initiative to look at how we can deploy better AI against um, aircraft that are being ma maintained, right? And some of these applications you mentioned earlier were simply, I don't anticipate there's a problem. So for industry that um, may not have a, a ethical reservation about doing defense work, but wants that defense work to be limited to those applications 
that they deem you know, uh, within their, their bounds. It's not the Department of Defense's prerogative to tell a company how to operate. That's their decision, and we fully support that. You need a robust and diverse community and industry. You don't want people to feel compelled to do DOD work, and we would never ask people to do DOD work that they don't want to do it. Um, that's, that's, not in our, that's not in our mandate. Um, but that, that's sort of the, so, I would, so those opportunities to partner are there. The, the harder question is, I think to your point, is what about those uh, real combat applications? You know, are we getting secondary AI players and industry partners developing those applications because maybe the big players or the leading AI companies don't want to be involved? Uh, I'll be uh, frank, that is a concern. I would throw out that, um, you know, uh, I, I put out the message here today that the, you know, OSD Project Maven initiative and the partnerships it's formed, um, I hope, would evoke in some degree an attempt to move beyond those who don't understand machine learning to those who do. We want to partner with the best in industry. We want to get access to the smartest engineers because we recognize these are very hard problems and they're going to take bleeding edge professionals partnering with us to be able to solve them. So, um, so I guess my point here is I can make that request. Uh, the opportunities are available. If you're a startup or a big tech company and you want to do this kind of work, we can define the parameters with which you're engaged so it meets your ethical guidelines. Uh, but um, you know, at the same time, the Department of Defense is going to de build and develop technology that's compliant with law and policy, that achieves its military objectives, and there are those who will partner with the DOD to do it. So we'll continue to build those relationships. I think a lot of the concerns that I've heard are employees that understand even if they sell a platform or a product, usually the military is able to add on or to modify it in some way to serve their mission objectives. And, and what does that mean? For example, uh, last early, earlier this year, Microsoft workers, a group of them, uh, got together to protest an army contract against HoloLens, which is an augmented um, reality headset. And that was basically the contract said that was going to be used to increase troop lethality. And the workers uh, said they didn't want to be involved in weapons development, and they warned that the technology would turn warfare more like a simulated video game. So maybe you can speak to the conversations that are happening at West Point and how is the US military um, ensuring that our soldiers are understanding the implications of, of warfare as it's gamified in this way? Um, and some of the conversations that are happening. Yeah, um, happy to. Um, every cadet at West Point, right, um, every student at West Point receive, takes a class called Military and Constitutional Law. Part of that course is instruction in the law of armed conflict. Um, so regardless of what their major is, cadets at West Point major in all matter of subjects, philosophy, English, math, engineering, right? But every cadet receives instruction in constitutional and military uh, law. Um, so uh, we take very seriously um, the obligation to instruct our future leaders on the um, limits uh, of their um, uh, uh, during combat. Um, in the Army, there's a DOD policy that requires annual briefings on the law of armed conflict. When I was in theater in Afghanistan, um, most of my time was uh, spent going to the various units on the installation that I was assigned to and instructing them on the law of armed conflict and the rules of engagement that implement that. Um, so uh, to answer your question directly, uh, it's, um, it's, it's inseparable from operational operations. Uh, the, the operational process includes instruction on the law of war, DOD's rules of engagement, um, mandate uh, compliance with the law of armed conflict, uh, and we take instruction uh, to our soldiers and our leaders very seriously. I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to open it up to Q&A. So if you have questions, please raise your hand, and a microphone will come to you. A lot of times um, in my engagement in Washington, DC, and now even coming here in Silicon Valley and engaging with the Defense Innovation Board and uh, the Defense Innovation Unit uh, here, I hear that the military wants human control. I hear that we, you know, we're going to conduct ourselves under IHL. Sometimes it feels like we're saying the same thing, but it feels like we're on separate teams. 
where do you see the role of civil society playing into this conversation? And Bonnie, Laura, where do you see the role of the military in forming this understanding of human control and human judgment? Um, where do we overlap? I can start. Please. You know, I, I, I agree. I think we are saying a lot of the same things. You're saying that um, the artificial intelligence systems that, that you've seen, um, they're, they're not up to scratch. They're, they, they can't explain themselves. They're, they're not reliable, right? Um, you're saying that you, you're saying that, that, that it's problematic. Uh, we're saying that it's problematic as well. Um, I, I think where we where we might differ is seeing seeing an, an, an end game. I, I think those of us on the campaign side maybe see that see that these systems we don't think that it's technically feasible to get them to the threshold where they can be responsibly used. Um, we've talked about some of the issues like the um, the black box lack of explainability effect the difficulty of testing, the complex systems issue. There's another big issue which I haven't even mentioned, and that is a thing called automation bias. Automation bias means that um, as a human, if, if a computer is usually fairly decent at giving us recommendations, when it gives us a recommendation, you'll pick yes. I mean, how many of us have done this, right? You know, you, just, you click okay. That, that, that's, that's automation bias. Automation bias is really powerful. Um, as an example, you know, there's people who've crashed their Teslas into the sides of trucks because they were watching a movie because their automation bias led them to believe that that would be fine. Automation bias is really powerful. Um, if, if, even if, and, and that makes the, the issue of human control so clouded. And that was a, a big part of our concern about Maven. You know, even if Maven was only ever giving recommendations, uh, kind of spotting patterns, there's this bias to believe what the computer tells us. And when the computer can't, can't explain itself when the computer is has potentially been trained on biased data, when when we don't fully understand what the computer is doing, this automation bias can lead us into a trap. I think the difference is we on the campaign side don't think these problems can be overcome, and we don't think that everybody, every country in the world who might develop these weapons will be responsible enough to to think about these things. So that's why we think that there should be a preemptive ban on these things, a legal instrument to ban them internationally. And um, I, th I think that that's really where our difference seems to lie. You know, I think te technologically you guys seem to be of many, the same opinions as I am. Anybody else? I, it's, a, it's a challenge for us to, um, you know, uh, yeah, I know there's somewhat of a, a, a drinking game out there whenever a military person comes out to Silicon Valley and mentions the, you know, geopolitical competition around AI. So I won't even, we, we've, we've avoided that, so I won't open it up. But I will say there are challenges with us being as transparent around uh, what we're doing with these technologies as we could be because of concerns of, you know, adversaries and what they're doing and how to protect information. That's why, you know, here today I'm not revealing the full extent of what Maven is up to. I can't really speak to our, our capabilities or intents. That's, you know, protected information. I, I will say that I, I agree with most of, of what you said. Some of the characterizations of Maven that have been made maybe aren't entirely accurate considering that most of our discussion to date has been related to the introduction of AI directly into a weapon system that will be using that AI to make a judgment in combat on who to kill or who not to kill. There, I would agree. I mean, I, we didn't go into as depth on the surveillance question. I think we kind of glossed over that because I think that brings a different set of considerations, perhaps. Um, but I think if we were to dig in, people would be surprised when they got under the hood that this department really values things like test and evaluation of algorithms, operational testing, understanding our data and its diversity, understanding where um, the data is limited and its ability to train an algorithm that can perform a function that we want it to perform. Um, our, you know, sort of recognition of bias in algorithms, particularly deep learning algorithms that may be trained on one set of data but present challenges when brought to another set of data or as the earlier pan panel mentioned, even if it's perfect data, that data doesn't include all the features you would need it to include to create the correct prediction, right? These are all areas we're looking at. They're areas we're studying. We don't release the details, that's privileged information, but um, I, you know, all I can say is we have policies in the department that regulate the use of autonomy and weapons. We follow those policies. I'm fully confident we're in line with all of those policies and we're concerned about doing this right and we'll continue to pursue it in that, in that, uh, you know, in that spirit. Um, I think that's a great question you asked, Marta. Um, so I agree with the, my other panelists that, that, uh, that we are on the same page in many 
in many ways, um, and I've heard this both today, but I've also heard it at various UN meetings that militaries don't want systems um, over which there's no human control. Uh, there's differences we need to fine tune what human control is, but there's, and the civil society feels the same way. I think in my experience in disarmament over the past 18 years, um, disarmament's very much a partnership. Uh, it's a partnership among civil society, militaries, governments, international organizations, and I, I hope that the process here will be the same as we wrestle with these complex issues. I think um, the military, um, one role is to, to provide us, to help provide information to the extent you can, and with taking into account national security issues, obviously, or um, information about what does the military see as uh, adequate control, um, and how does, and that, and because you, um, you have access to certain information civil society may not have, and certain operational understandings. I think civil society and others also bring um, disarmament diplomatic experience, um, and these aren't necessarily a clear dividing line, but just generally speaking. And I think where we differ is, in some case, at least with some states, not all states, is on what the, the solution is and whether um, the majority of states at the UN have called for new international law, some states have not. Civil society tends to favor, believe that existing IHL is important but not adequate. And I think that that's sort of where the dialogue needs to continue, um, that existing, we feel like new laws needed to bring extra clarity to increase global norms and the stigma. And we welcome dialogue and working with um, militaries to understand how we can go about doing that. Absolutely. Any audience questions queued up? Um, yep, microphones, please. So much for this panel. It's very interesting. Um, on the accountability prong, and also being mindful of um, federal, federal Tort Claim Act litigation, one of the issues on the immunities is discretionary function exceptions. And so, kind of how, when you think through and, and talk about the role of AI, if if you're really talking about limiting the discretionary function or automation bias, how would this interplay on, you know, if you're thinking about companies who are considering whether they want a contract, if they're gonna open themselves up to certain liabilities, because they could no longer do those offenses, that's one thing. And also, in terms of the accountability prong for, um, on the other side, for the survivor side, can we talk about immunities and these kinds of civil accountability mechanisms that exist? That's a great question. Thank you. We're taking multiple questions, or should we go? Um, yeah, um, I suggest we take a round of questions and then I throw it back to you. Sure. There was one here and one there. Big get microphone. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so I have a um, two-part question. One for um, Robert, and another is for jo uh, Joseph. I'm here. Uh, this one. Um, and I think the first question uh, you are mentioning about uh, patents being in secrecy, and I think there was a law of um, Invention Secrecy Act of 1951 where government can take away any of the patents and people can't disclose uh, what they have discovered. And um, so I don't know how it applies. I heard it still applies where people lost their patents for timeless series of uh, stock analysis. And the second question I had was about um, you mentioned about necessity of surveillance during wartime uh, that breaks down to uh, surveillance of um, individual for non-war time because of xenophobia. Uh, what it breaks down to, like when a Middle Eastern person comes and goes on a day trip and tries to take pictures of the surroundings, then he has been surveilled by the local people because they assume he is a competent or some uh, random person. Maybe one more, and then we'll do a round of answers. I think there's some out front. Yep. A question in regards to the 3000.09, 3000.19. It's, um, I have a neuro background here at Stanford, and it's about human performance in the loop for these AI systems. I know for our Department of Defense policy, as you guys mentioned, that the humans have to be in the loop, that a human officer has to be responsible for the weapon systems involved. So my question is, is that there are other countries and other people who are considering using other autonomous weapons that wouldn't, humans would not be in the loop. And the advantage of that is that the human not being in the loop would mean a fewer delay on that because human performance, we would need at minimum a quarter of a second in order to 
have that decision process for our perform to receive the information, make a decision, and react upon it at best. So obviously that quarter of a second at best would delay that process in order to take action upon it. And that would be that quarter of a second advantage for a purely autonomous system to act on it. So my question is, is that the compared to, I mean, so the consideration is on the other side of it, right? We have on this one side, we have the advantage of we're being more responsible. We have a very ethical, we have a very strong framework of building these ethical weapon systems that we can distinguish and be able to distinguish in who we target and from between civilian and enemy. But on the other hand, we have maybe other actors who don't have such restrictions. What are your guys' thoughts in regards to other people who may or may not be developing those, who may be working under different ethical frameworks to achieve a different performance gap? Thank you. So we've got um, looking at accountability for victims, companies being worded that liable, uh, looking at speed and efficiency in warfare, countries that don't share the same uh, human rights values as the United States does, and then uh, protecting marginalized populations and the effects of surveillance. Touch on whichever one of those you would like. Bonnie, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll touch on a, a couple. Um, first, with the terms of accountability, um, I think this, the civil accountability is, is something uh, of which there's also a potential gap um, because of the immunity for weapons manufacturers, and there may be reasons for that, but I think this is an area where um, we can't just assume that um, victims or survivors could uh, bring a program or manufacturer to court um, unless there was a very intentional, sort of more criminal-like, uh, you know, uh, action on the part of the program or manufacturer to make a, a bad weapon, so to speak. But um, it, I do have serious concerns that tort liability will help the situation. And plus, it's very impractical for and costly, and often survivors and victims are in conflicts far away from wherever. Um, the the state that used a certain weapon, there's not always it's not always the local courts, or even if it if it's a civil internal armed conflict, there may be the government may not be the best place to seek redress. So I think there's a lot of concerns there in terms of um, the civil the civil liability, which adds to this package of concerns I've had about moral, legal, ethical, security concerns with these weapons, and then also just respond quickly on the. The uh, speed of response, um, I mean, I think this goes to sort of what is meaningful human control. I think if there, I agree with my panelists that Aegis is not the problem here. It to operate has a very narrow operating environment. It, you need speed in that situation where you're having an incoming missile, but I'm less concerned about it making determinations that are problematic. Um, but I think there's a reason uh, IHL sets sets requirements for reflection um, and that, you know, arguably a quarter second may give your enemy adversary a, a uh, advantage. Um, but there's, I, you know, that's, if they're acting in a non-compliant, in a way non-compliant with IHL, do we want to follow that standard? Do we want to compete at the expense of complying with international law? And I'd also point out that this is a reason why um, we, Human Rights Watch and um, campaign NGOs across the world have been arguing for a preemptive uh, prohibition or a preemptive norm requiring meaningful human control because it's ultimately, in the, we believe in the advantage, it'd be, states would be better off if no one had them. Um, so to the extent we can prevent this kind of technology, I'm talking about weaponized AI, not all AI in warfare now, but to the extent we can preempt it, we'd be better off. And that's what happened in 1995 with the blinding lasers protocol. Um, another emerging technology that raised different concerns, but a lot of the same um, dialogue took place. And so I think that that's a good model, and as opposed to other weapon systems where people have also decided that it was better for no one to have them, like chemical weapons, but they did it after they were used. So um, that's a couple of responses to your, your question. Thanks. Maybe we'll just go down the line. Sure. Um, you know, as for the, the first two questions um, regarding uh, laws with which I'm not too familiar. I would have to think about that. Uh, I don't really have a great answer for accountability of private corporations, except to say, you know, uh, 
probably there's not much difference between AI and other problems in that domain. Um, but I, I really have to look and think about that a little bit more. Um, the, the, the harder question, which is the one over here, which is, you know, what do you do about an adversary in a military setting or combat setting that doesn't have the same ethical limitations and maybe because of that, um, they're, they're cycling more faster, they're able to make decisions faster and therefore gain the upper hand. You know, in that, in that context, the way we've been thinking about it, of course, everything in the law of armed conflict balances against military necessity, right? Um, and, um, you know, frankly, I don't have the answers here. I wish I did. I think it's an area where um, we need some time to learn and explore this technology and see its implementation before we can even begin to answer a question that hard. Um, so uh, I, you know, respectfully defer uh, from answering it unless uh, my counterpart, military, my lawyer over here, has a better answer. <laughs> so, so the law of war has a mechanism. The law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, has traditionally has a mechanism for dealing with the problem you're suggesting, and it's called reprisal. A reprisal is. Um, the, the, uh, the rule of reprisal says that when one party to an armed conflict violates the law of war, supposedly it, suppose it targets a civilian, right? That's a violation. Targeting a civilian, as I said, is a violation. Uh, a reprisal would be a violation in turn, a response violation with the aim of bringing the violating party back into compliance. You could see the trouble, the potential trouble with such a rule, right? Potential escalatory effects. Um, in 1977, um, there was uh, a treaty called the Additional Pro the Geneva Conventions, or you, many of you will have heard of these, they were written in the wake of World War II in the 40s, late 40s, and uh, in addition to those Geneva Conventions called the Additional Protocols, which were drafted in 1977, prohibits many, but not all, reprisals. Um, because of the escalatory risk. Um, the United States is not a party to those additional protocols. However, DOD policy, again, is um, uh, to comply with the law of war, to comply with the law of armed conflict, regardless of the um, adversary's compliance, right? So w w we, we have policies in place uh, that's, that uh, uh, prevent reprisals. But um, it's a really hard, it's a, you know, it's a really hard question, right? What do you, you want a, a mechanism of deterrence in place, but it's, it's the balance of necessity and humanity uh, that we were just talking about. How do you strike that right balance? Uh, reprisals goes on the necessity side, but uh, you add the cost of humanity. So through policy, the United States um, uh, will not engage in reprisals, uh, but its position is that the law of war does not require that. Laura? Yeah, um, I think I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the last question's points. So you talked about uh, humans in the loop and uh, versus on the loop and, and the response time. So part of the reasons that, that militaries want these systems, one part is speed, as you say, and another part is to be able to operate in contexts where, where communication is not possible. So communication may be jammed in areas or um, if, if you're operating submarines underwater, um, communication is basically impossible. You can get like a very little, tiny amount of bandwidth. So yeah, part of the point is, is speed and part of the point is to be able to operate outside of communications. If you've got a human who is giving um, confirmations when, 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 the, when the machine asks something, that, that will be what you're saying in the loop. Um, sort of a human is being proposed um, to, to attack and, and the human is saying yes. I talked about automation bias earlier. I think it's very clear if a human is giving a answer in, in a quarter of a second, you know, the, the system has automated the human and you know, not vice versa, right? So the human clearly can't make any sensible decision making in, in, in that point of time. So it's going to be considerably slower. If you're talking about human on the loop, this is where a human is, is theoretically in a position to be able to interrupt a, a system in, in, in operation. So, um, uh, so a system is, is you know, flying around or swimming around and saying, OK, I'll, I, I'm, I'm thinking that I will attack this thing now. And the human can say no. That, that will be on the loop. And uh, yeah, that, that, 
that potentially doesn't slow the system down, but you've also got no way of guaranteeing that the human has actually had a chance to, to see this and respond. So, but a lot of people, a lot, there, are, there are some proposals for this human on the loop thing, and I think it's completely out of order. I think the only practical, safe way, um, as I mentioned earlier, to, to actually have these autonomous systems, which do have some valid defensive purposes, is to have the, the human physically co-located with the weapon and able to physically disable it. One thing we didn't touch on at all, of course, is the fact that these systems can be hacked. And um, you know, if it, in, in a hacked system, the only defense would be to have a human who can physically disable it. Um, you also, so you sort of talked about the, the the wider picture here of what happens when when um, when what one party is not bound by the same ethical constraints. Um, well, and this is an ethical race to the bottom. You know, we we, we don't say just because uh, one 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 actor in in a conflict is, is not abiding by IHL. This does not give other parties in a conflict the right to also abandon IHL and do what they please. I, I believe I'm right in saying that, right? Yeah. So um, you know, even even if one actor is using an illegal weapon, that doesn't give the, the right to 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 use retribution, as you say. You know, and, and the same is true of all the other weapons. Pragmatically, the passion and disarmament, and Bonnie may be able to corroborate this, is seems to be there are two kind of weapons that it's easy to ban. One kind of weapon is where the, um, the gruesomeness of the weapon kind of outweighs the military usefulness. So blinding lasers are probably not that militarily useful, so relatively easy to ban. And then another way is, you know, if you've only got a very small number of actors who might be party to a treaty, and it's something that they can preemptively ban to, to have greater stability. So if you'd be talking sort of things like the US-Russia treaty bans back during the 80s or so when they, you know, they banned nuclear bombs on the moon and they banned nuclear bomb, nuclear launches from the bottom of the sea and like a variety of crazy stuff like that that didn't exist yet. Um, those are relatively easy to do because preemptive and a small number of parties. It is quite hard to ban these weapons, um, potential, the, the potential for autonomous um, weapons. Firstly, nobody knows what the kind of military advantages will be for sure. I personally think not that much because there's a great there's a great history in warfare of, you know, really complicated technical solutions that people thought would be great and actually turned out to be complete rubbish. Um, there's a really good book, um, Army of None, and there's also another really good book called Kill Chain by Andrew Cockburn, who I think is a journalist with the Washington Post. Um, so he, he one of the first chapters is about the the schemes that this crowd called the Jasons, um, who are pointy heads that contract out to the U.S. government for uh, you know crazy science stuff. Uh, so they had this crazy scheme where they carpeted the jungles in Vietnam with little little explodey um, things the size of aspirins and, and also microphones, directional microphones and sensors for urine and stuff like that. And the idea was they'd be able to carpet the jungle in sensors and know where their enemies were going to be and you know pick them off with, uh, with targeted strikes. It did not work at all. There's a great history of technological innovation not working very well. And some of it does work. But I think probably the we're, we're in we're at the top of a cycle of huge technological hype about AI, and we're kind of saying, hey, AI is quite good at giving me you know like three word suggestions for email replies, and it's quite good at picking out cat videos. So maybe we can use it in a warfare. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a leap, quite a leap. You know, um, like I say, the, the, the problem is really complex, and we're not there yet. So. It, there's all these unanswered questions. You know, I personally think that autonomous warfare or AI warfare is, in most applications, more likely to do more harm than good. Probably not likely to give that big of a strategic edge, but nobody knows for sure. So it's, it, uh, that's why banning it is, is hard, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop. Do we we'll take one last questions? round of quick questions and then right. get you out for a 10-minute so break. Short as you can, please. Yes, very short. Oh, the answer. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, what, something that we haven't talked about as much is the role of the deep learning researcher and the deep learning scientist um, kind of in these sorts of conversations. And specifically, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, a question for you as to, you kind of briefly talked about geopolitics. Um, we, had, we had seen like OpenAI release their language model and then not release the really good version of their language model due to the ethical concerns. I'm curious if you can kind of speak to the obligation of the AI researcher both to the military community and to the country, and also how we can think about, should we put a pause and delay on certain research agendas, or should we be kind of publishing publishing things as we, as we work on them? Good question. Uh, also for the lieutenant colonel, 
We live in a four space era. So terrestrial, cyber, outer space, and the combination of all three. When you add AI in space, and you add the vagaries of a space treaty written for the Cold War era, not the commercial space era, how do you sort out the ability or the uh, fragility of knocking out commercial space supply chains that you might rely on? Hello, last question over here. Um, this is directed at Colonel Larson, sir. Um, you mentioned that public and private partnerships will continue um, with, with, within the DOD in your AI development. And you mentioned that on your, in, on your unit level, in, in terms of your personal leadership vision, that you, your desire and, and the need to partner with Silicon Valley engineers and experts from academia to get good advice and to inform uh, your unit of the pitfalls in, in areas that your team might not have um, the, the, the academic expertise. And I applaud that effort to collaborate to get the best information. Um, the Defense Department re recently ended the contract with the Jasons, um, which is an independent, uh, you mentioned, an independent panel of academics to advise the Pentagon for the past 59 years. Uh, the contract ended uh, late last March, and then as of last week, the group ran out of money. So sir, my question is, is are you concerned that your bosses, and I'm talking on the 07 and above level here, um, don't share the same desire that you do to work with the best and brightest in industry to operate in what you deem to be the most ethical and informed way. You have the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so many questions, and all of them hard. So maybe I'll, I'll take the first one and then let my panelists jump in while I think about the other ones. Um, so the first one was about the role of the deep learning researcher in this process, right? And, and also just the proliferation of research in the open source that's led to the explosion in artificial intelligence that we're discussing here today. I think it is noteworthy that unlike other transformative technologies, you know, thinking of the 20th century, you'd be remiss to, if you talk to your average general in the Pentagon and you were to say, you know, what have we seen that compares to artificial intelligence in terms of its potential impact and the character and perhaps even the nature of war, There'd be very few examples. They'd be things like nuclear power. They'd be things like the advent of aviation. And of course, those were driven by a post-World War II or post-World War I industrial defense-driven process where the IP was coming from the DOD, not from academia, or is coming from academia in partnership with the DOD for specific utilization in defense projects. Here with the, you know, the explosion of deep learning, we don't have that. Right, that the tools, the research is being done in academia, it's being published, it's available to all. Um, the, and not just the research, but then the research is converted into very specific tooling. The common open source frameworks that generate AI, the most performant frameworks available in the world are open source. I can get TensorFlow, I can get PyTorch, and that's one aspect I think we've been remiss in discussing today is, you know, we've been talking a lot about nation state investments in AI, right, but this is way more challenging because any you don't have to be a deep learning scientist to download TensorFlow, train a rough object detection model, put it on a, a drone, and then fly that drone into a target, right? That is not limited to the Defense Department and its capability to institute those technologies, right? So um, where, I, where I was talking about the role of the deep learning researcher is, you know, I would advise, you know, there are some that would say, you know, we need more controls. We need to tighten it down. We need to control research. I don't know, I don't have the answers there. That's not, that's not my mandate to talk about, you know, potential export controls or investments and how we should change investments in research to get to those things. Where I will tell you I'm unsatisfied as an AI project manager, an AI chief today, is what I'm not seeing out of research are the true metrics for being able to look at what the performance of a deep learning model is when applied in a real world setting that's diverse and complicated. Right, you know, like an academic leaderboard for something like a Kaggle competition, where they're just looking at an F1 score, or rock score, or mean average precision. These are meaningless numbers when we're talking about how a system performs in an environment for a mission, right, that we need to understand. And so I, I do think there is room for the Defense Department that they have, to, they have to do that, they have to understand. And then as we mentioned earlier, we have to be able to explain Right, we have to, if we're gonna utilize deep learning in the Defense Department, we need to break open the black box and know what's in that black box, or it's frankly not a viable technology for us to bring into something like an autonomous weapons system, 
Um, the only balancing argument to that is, of course, an argument of extreme military necessity. And I think our, my counterpart over there raised a great point about the military not being interested in an ethical race to the bottom. Right? We've been engaged for many years in combat with adversaries who have engaged in uh, activities that were outside the law of armed conflict. You won't see us employing those same tactics just to maintain a military advantage. And um, you know, I'm a proud member of the military. I would not be a proud member of the military if we were banning our ethical principles in uh, an achievement of something that wasn't an absolute military necessity to maintain national security and continue to advance the ideals of the Enlightenment, right? Um, so so uh, I think that's probably enough on that from my perspective. All right, we've got space and other domains and also the termination of the contract with the Jason scientists. Does anyone have any insights? So I'll just say the, the space issue, this is an issue of applying rules and law that is very old to new domains, right? That will always be a, that will always be a challenge. As Colonel Larson just highlighted, um, when after you know, September of 2001, we found ourselves in an armed conflict against an enemy who on the battlefield was not, uh, not interested in complying with the law. Right? And so when one party of the conflict isn't interested in complying, how do you distinguish, right? The law requires distinction. How do you distinguish when the opposing party is purposefully trying to make it hard, right? Well, our, our, our morals and our ethics, again, not, this is not a race to the bottom. Our policy is that we'll apply the law of war regardless of where, whether the other side does. Um, it, it, is a, it is a problem of applying old law to new problems. That will happen in, in AI. That will happen in cyber. That is happening in those areas. It's a challenge we need to work through. The best we can do is have discussions like this um, with multiple perspectives uh, and um, to, to, to make the rules the most humane we can while maintaining our ability to protect ourselves and our values. Sorry, final word. Um, so I, I very much agree with you. You mentioned that um, it's going to be very easy for somebody to um, potentially drain something, no, train something based on open source um, open source frameworks and, and available hardware to build a weapon. And I, I fully agree. And in fact, this sort of thing seems to be happening already, or probably remote control, but we've seen drones attempted to be used in assassinations already. Um, we think that it'll be much worse if we're talking autonomous, military-built, hardened drones with more advanced software. Um, if one military is building these, then they, they will be sold, and they will be they will be sold to all sorts of groups who may not use them in the ways that we would like to see them used. Um, so that's, you know, a, a ban creates a norm against building and using these and potentially clarifies um, existing IHL um, on whether or not they can be used. I mean, a lot of people think that IHL already uh, bans these things, but you know, it's, 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 it's unclear. There's debate around this. You know, a, a treaty would make it clear that they are beyond the pale. They are taboo. Nobody, sh nobody should be building these things. And Yes, they're probably still going to be built, but I would rather that they're jerry-rigged crappy ones than you know, really awesome military-hardened ones, right? <laughs> That's my take on it. I think there, there's room to debate that contention. Um, you know, uh, so I've been involved mostly in counterinsurgency campaigns where the predominant uh, uh, combat weapon of our adversary that resulted in the most U.S. casualties over the course of those operations were jerry-rigged. Yeah. Systems. They weren't military hardened systems, and I wouldn't underestimate, right, the the sophistication of what can be built from home or even from a loosely organized non-state actor, and the amount of damage it would cause. And then on the flip side, I'd point out not all military systems are a complex, multi-billion-dollar piece of hardware. That the squad leader needs to know if there's an ambush waiting for him over the next hill. And that may be a quadcopter with a simple object detection algorithm to identify an ambush, right? So I think that argument cuts both ways and is more complex than just uh, non-state, simple, military, hardened, and sophisticated. Absolutely. It's definitely a complex issue, and I hope everyone here in the room learned something today. I know even I did, and this is part of what I work on. Um, thank you to all the panelists for your presentations and for um, being clear and concise and giving us some insight and transparency. Um, it's definitely we need a better shared understanding of this topic because it is complex. So we'll continue this discussion at the UN, I'm sure at the Pentagon and at other venues. And if you're a student, 
and you want to do research on this, come talk to me because I can connect you with professors. Obviously, there's a lot of research to be done.